Okay, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents, I don't want to have to start the video over. I just need to make sure that the new headset that I'm using, which has a microphone attached to the headset, is working. Uh, won't be any music in the background today for the most part. That is um, not going to have it today. Got some things to talk about. We have two things to talk about. Now, the first one, we're going to talk about a little bit of this end times stuff that a lot of videos are up and a lot of people are asking about and wondering about. I wasn't planning on answering any phone calls, but hold on one second. Ladies and gentlemen, I just got a call from a robocaller. Um, I'm on the do not call list. So when I was asking the person, hey, you people need to take my number out of your system. She hung up on me. The first thing she says was, do you speak a, a Spanish? Not making fun of her accent, but that's the way she said it. It was a Florida call. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a software. It's called Drope. I've spoken about this software before. Drope Mod APK. It works on your Android phone. It is a pretty useful software, okay? It allows me to block calls coming into my phone. So not only did I report the number as spam, yes, it allows you to report it as spam, that way calls into your phone or other people's phone, it'll show up as spam. Also, it lets me block the calls so that they don't bother me again. Drope, ladies and gentlemen. All right. That's just extra information for those of you. Uh, because I, I don't like those calls. I only answered the phone because I thought it was one of you. Because I told you guys, I answer my phone. <laughs> I don't run from people. Well, I don't recognize the number. That's why I didn't answer. Please. If I don't recognize the number, who the, what you calling my number for? Oh, no, nah, no. Nah, next time, let me know who you is. Then you ain't got to have that attitude. What? Then don't call me no more. Click. You see? That's how those conversations go. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, I do have a lot to talk about. I'm going to tell you, I promise you, that if you don't learn something in this video, then there's something wrong with you. You don't need to be sucking in air. You don't need to be sucking in a single ounce of air because you're robbing those individuals on this planet who have some common and some regular sense. There ain't no such thing as common sense. Shut up. Okay. It was a hyperbole. What's a hyperbole? Well, it's high at the top and perb in the middle. Hyperbole. There you go. Now you know what a hyperbole is. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, you can finish your video now. Thank you. I appreciate you giving me permission. Ladies and gentlemen, the first thing I want to talk about is these end day thing. Okay, sorry. Uh, this is the study article number 33, Watchtower. Find joy in the privileges you have. This is for a meeting this coming Sunday, October 18th to 24th, the week of. The Watchtower is just an aid in studying the Bible. So they pick a subject. Let's show you how it works. This is the theme scripture. Starts Ecclesiastes. And all the scriptures in here focuses on that theme. Because that's the way the Bible is designed. The Bible is designed for you to use one scripture after the other, after the other, throughout the Bible to understand what's going on. Now, the reason why I'm saying that, because if you notice when Jesus... Yes, I said the word Jesus. There's nothing wrong with saying the word Jesus. Ah, oh, Jesus, please! Okay, there was nothing wrong with saying the word Jesus. A lot of people get offended when you start saying the name Jesus or Jehovah. When Jesus was talking with Satan, he said it is written. And he used different books of the Bible to defend his father. Oh, by the way, there are a lot of people out there who believe Jesus is God. First, we just talked about Satan tempting Jesus. If Jesus was God, what possible temptation could Satan tempt 
God with. Now, hold on. No, 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 no. Don't even imagine it because it wouldn't make sense if you were to utter anything else. Also, how could Jesus be offered all the kingdoms of the world if he were God and Satan think that that was a bona fide temptation? Because it had to be a bona fide temptation. You follow me? That's the other phone ringing. And I'm not going to answer it. I'm sorry. It's going to keep ringing because I use that phone strictly for the internet. So it's going to stop in a minute. I apologize for that. The second point is, if Jesus were God and Satan tempted God, then that would mean that Satan had something to offer God that God himself didn't have access to. Something ain't right with that picture. If Jesus were God. Well, he and God, they separated. You know, they were one and then they split. Wonder twin powers deactivate. Excuse me, ladies and gentlemen. That type of thing is nowhere to be found in scripture. Where Jesus and God were one and then they separated. There is nothing in scripture to indicate anything like that. That is the biggest hyperbole that ever could be imagined. But then we're not here to talk about such things. We're here to talk about the end, quote unquote, times. Now, a lot of people refer to the end times. Ladies and gentlemen, give me one second. I have to type it in the right way. T-I-M-E of the E-N-D. The Bible doesn't use the phrase end time. Now, there might be some translations that might speak of end times. But you need to understand, when the Bible says time of the end, it's not referring to the destruction of the earth. Go back and look at Genesis, the ninth chapter, roughly verse 6, where he says that he would never destroy the earth, ever again. People say, well, he said by fire, I mean by water. This time it's going to be by fire. He ain't never said that. Go back and look at Ecclesiastes. I believe it is the first chapter, verse 4, where it talks about day and night. Night and day will never cease. Okay, these are just brief synapses of what's going to happen. By the way, also go back and look at the book of Psalms, the 37th chapter, where it talks about people living forever on the earth. So, the earth will never stop being. Sorry, it's just the way it is. We're going to Daniel. Daniel? That's right, we're going to go to Daniel. The reason why we're going to go to Daniel is because we're talking about the time of the end okay not the end times but the time of the end let's see the end of that time is not what we're looking for we're looking for the exact phrase time of the end so we have to go all the way to the 12th chapter where you at 12 until the time of the end because it is yet for the appointed time. He, Daniel was told to seal up the book. Why? This is the 11th chapter, by the way. But he was told to seal up the book until this time, and then that's when true knowledge of the scriptures would become abundant. Everybody thinks it's universal knowledge, like the universe has got knowledge or something. People, stop adding to the scriptures. It is, it is not becoming. In the time of the end, the king of the south will engage with him in a pushing. Talking about the king of the south and the king of the north. It is not the end times, it is the time of the end. Okay, now I'm not going to go into any more detail about this. I just want to, he says, seal up the book until the time of the end. Many will rove about and the true, remember God's word is truth, knowledge will become abundant. It is not that everybody and their grandmama would understand. It says the knowledge will become abundant. Why? Because the scripture says that the light continues to get brighter and brighter as the day draws near. So true knowledge has become abundant. We understand the majority of the scriptures. Why? Because we have the entire Bible to compare to Bring about a better understanding. There you go!
Now you know. Now, again, about the time of the end, what are the things that are supposed to happen? I'm going to do you a large favor. Okay, I don't want the study notes of Matthew. I want Matthew itself. So let's see if we can get to Matthew itself. Let's see. Matthew's 24. That's where we're going. We're going to go here. Matthew's 24, 7. Now, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to find out Jesus was talking to them disciples. He says, hey, as he was departing from the temple, the disciples, only three of them, approached him privately. And they said, hey, look at all these buildings and look at that temple. Isn't it magnificent? And in response, he said to them, do you not see all these things? Truly, I say to you, by no means will a stone be left upon a stone and not be torn down. Now, I'm quoting because I've known this, but I, I said, it says left here now in this version. By no means will a stone be left here upon a stone and not be torn down or thrown down. Ladies and gentlemen, when the Romans came in and destroyed the temple, they did not leave one stone unturned or torn down. That's where, do not leave one stone unturned. That's where it comes from, people. Oh, really? That's interesting. Now, notice what the disciples say in verse 3. It says, while he was sitting upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples approached him privately saying, Hey, look, Lord, you've been saying all these things for the last several years. We've seen your miracles. We know that you are the Son of God. We know that you are the promised Messiah. We know that you are the Christ. Will you please tell us when will these things be? And what will be the sign of not of your second coming, the Bible does not say anything about a second coming. Go back and look at the scriptures. It does not use the word second under any circumstances. He came in the flesh once for all times. He will not come in the flesh ever again. So it's not a second coming. Oh, you know what? That makes a lot of sense. Okay, I'm going to stop using second coming and I'm just going to say when he comes again. Here we go again. Okay. That's why they use the word presence, because it comes from the word... Man, I just lost the Greek word. And it's parousia. I'm, I'm trying to remember, because it's been a while since I've had to use the Greek word. It means presence. Okay. And let's see if this gives us that Greek word. Uh, no, not that one. No, nah, I'm not going to go through all that right now. This is not supposed to be that long of a video on this subject. End of the conclusion, or the end of the system of things. The end is talking about man's rulership of the world. You notice, ever since Adam sinned, man was given the right, temporarily, to make decisions on their own. Because Adam said, hey, I should be able to make my own decision. And that's what he did. And so God said, you know what? Since that idiot did what he did, I don't want this question to ever come up again. So I'm going to give man an opportunity. See if they can rule themselves. I.e. Nimrod. Remember Lamech? A man struck me, so I killed him. That's men making their own decisions contrary to what he had already designed. He is allowing man to rule and Satan to be their God. You don't believe me? Why could Satan tempt Jesus saying, I'll give you all these kingdoms and their glory because it has been given to me? Go back and look at Luke, the 21st chapter. So that time period is about to end. That's what Jesus came to the earth for, was to let everybody know. The Jews were supposed to be that first group that were supposed to be special. And they rejected him and killed him. Sorry, it's just a fact. He was killed not by the Romans. He was killed by the Jews. Don't mistake it. They're the ones who pronounced death on him. 
They're the ones who said he should be put to death. Pilate was getting ready to release him. So the Jews are the ones who killed Jesus. Pilate succumbed to their request. He said to them, you, take him yourselves and see to it. So the Romans did not kill Jesus. It was the Jews. Remember, he was killed in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, the Jews were allowed to rule over themselves. They had a provincial government. They allowed them to take care of their own internal affairs because they were under military occupation. All you got to do is go back and look at history. All right, notice this. They asked them three questions. When will these things be? What will be the sign? Not signs. The sign, meaning composite. Because he's going to give them a composite sign, not with an S. A composite sign, we're going to explain why that is. Sign of your presence or sign of your return. Not a second coming, but a return. And the conclusion of the system of things. Ladies and gentlemen, let's find out if he gave them an answer. In answer, Jesus said to them, <laughs> look out! Told him, look out! Hold on! Don't go that way! Somebody's over there waiting for you. That nobody misleads you. Ladies and gentlemen, all of you who sit up there and listen to somebody just wah, 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 and they don't show you what the scriptures are saying, that's your fault. He said, he warned you against those individuals who are just going to tell you what they think, which is why you believed it was a second coming. Which is why you believe Jesus is God when the Bible says that he is God's son. Every five-year-old knows that Jesus is God's son. Every five-year-old knows that Jesus remained in subjection to his parents. God can never be in subjection to anything, ever. Go back. Take a look. And look at the logic of the fact that people are saying that God was made subject to death. Remember, Jesus remained dead in the grave for three days. God cannot die. Sorry, God cannot die. I don't care how you put it. I don't care what language you put it in. I don't care how you spell it. God cannot die. He cannot lie. Those are things he can never do. People say God can do anything. No, he cannot. He cannot die. He cannot lie. Those are things he can't do, not things he can do. So God cannot do everything. Oh, you blaspheme? Really? He's the one who says in the book of 1 Timothy, the first chapter, verse 12, that he cannot lie. I didn't say that. He's the one who inspired Paul to let you know he cannot lie. He's the one who inspired the psalmist to say that he's from eternity to eternity, which means he cannot die. So again, those are things he cannot do. Oh, okay, since you put it that way, it makes a lot of sense. You need to be clarifying yourself a little. No, I don't need to clarify myself. What people need to do is they need to stop reading into words and start looking at what it says. Look, he says, look, I I'm... You're going to hear wars and rumors of wars, reports of wars. See that you are not alarmed. Pay attention. For these things, people misleading people, saying that he's the Christ, you know, people sitting up there misleading people about what the scriptures say, and wars and conflicts with other nations. He says, see that you are not alarmed, for these things must, they have to take place. Why? Because man is, that's what man does. Men, when they're ruling over themselves, they come up with all kind of junk. Theories, doctrines, speeches, beliefs, religions, and so forth. That's why all wars that have ever taken place on this earth has been over religion. Every single one of them. One person's beliefs over another person's beliefs. That's the way of the world. 
but pay attention. But the end is not yet. So when will the end? When is going to be the end? Come on now. Well, notice this. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. The first time that ever happened was World War I. Prior to that, there were empires. Somebody actually tried to argue with me on that. Never before was the world anything other than empires prior to the United States doing that stupid revolution, Britain was the empire. Okay, the sun never set on the British Empire. Why? Because they controlled so much. They were called the British Empire. Well, there was Spain. Yes, and who else? Well, there was Spain. Okay, and who else? Well, there were some Chinese empires and some Japanese empires. Yes, they were all empires. They were not nations and kingdoms. Go on now. Go back and, go back and look at history. Nations and kingdoms did not exist at that time. Well, there were other nations. Yes, they were small, minor nations with no power. Well, there were some African nations and they had power. They had power over what? They didn't control anything. They did not control the world. Africa is not the world. There are seven continents on this planet. Africa is only one. And they didn't, any of those nations in Africa did not control the whole country. But I guarantee you, Britain controlled all commerce. You wanted to sell between those other continents, those other nations, you had to go through Britain. Britain is the one who controlled. They controlled the oceans too. You wanted to sell commerce and you wanted to sell across them seas, just like today. You cannot transport what you want across the seas. You cannot sell to whatever nation you want when you feel like it. Do you not know that places like Puerto Rico those individuals cannot buy from any other country except the United States. So everything that comes into Puerto Rico comes from the United States. If they get something that comes from China, it has to first come into the United States through a different company that's allowed to buy from China, and then it's shipped to Puerto Rico. So not only do they pay for the tax coming into the United States, but they pay the tax going out of the United States into Puerto Rico. That's how they do the Puerto Rican people. Why? Because they cannot buy, sell, eat, or drink without permission. So, he says, for nations will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Ladies and gentlemen, the first time all the nations of the world fought and all the kingdoms of the world, major kingdoms, major nations, was World War One. It was so important that they called it World War One. Two thousand years in advance, he prophesied that. Then he said there will be food shortages and earthquakes in one place after another. Pay attention. All of these things have to happen at the same time. There's always been food shortages, but never has there been so many people dying of famine and starvation then since World War I, in all of man's history prior. Even with all the famines that we read about in history, never has it been worse. Why? Because of the amount of people that we have on the planet and because of commerce, because of the control of the food chain. Then we have earthquakes. Do you know that there have been more earthquakes on the planet that were magnitude six or above since 1914 than ever recorded in the history of the world prior in combination. So prior to 1914, you add up all of those major earthquakes and they don't even come close to the amount that's happened since 1914. Now he says all these things have to happen at the same time. Now how could he prophesy this, saying that all these things would happen during this period of time, 2,000 years in advance? No one's that accurate. Notice, verse number 8, y'all. Verse number 8 is important. And then we're going to get to our other conversation. All these things are the beginning of pangs of distress. So when you put them together, happening together, that's what shows that he has returned. Not in the flesh, because he didn't say he was coming back in the flesh. 
So everybody who's waiting for him to come back in the flesh, stop it. He ain't never said that. His return is continuous, not just one event. He says, during this time, people will hand his disciples, because he's talking to his disciples, people will hand you over to tribulation and will kill you on account of what? Hold on. Let's find out why they're going to be killing his people. And you will be hated by all the nations on account of my name. Really? What's, what's his name got to do with it? Well, we're going to find one last scripture. And this good news of the kingdom, not the good news of whatever you think, but the good news of his father's kingdom will be preached in all the inhabited earth for a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. The good news will be preached. Do you know why? Because before the end comes, that thing that everybody's waiting on, ladies and gentlemen, before the end comes, the good news has to be preached. Okay, this is what's known as the day's text. What I want to show you guys is something about that good news being preached. We go to Acts the 8th chapter, verse 4. So you guys know what his disciples were doing. However, those who had been scattered went through the land declaring the good news of the word. Yes, they went preaching about God's kingdom. After they were dragged, both men and women, and turning them over to prison, after they went through persecution. Now, Jesus' sign was not talking about those last days. Although he did prophesy that they were going to go through that, he was talking about these last days. So it's not the end times, ladies and gentlemen, it is the time of the end when, sorry, there is one more scripture. Daniel, where you at? Oh, there go Daniel, y'all. Okay, we are going to go to the second chapter of Daniel. Why? Because we need the second chapter. And when we go to the second chapter of Daniel, let's make sure. Okay, we can go to verse number 44. In those days, what days? The days of those kings. What kings? The ones who exist today? Presidents, leaders, prime ministers. The God of the heavens will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And this kingdom will not be passed on to any other people. It will crush and put an end, time of the end, to all these kingdoms, man-made, ruled kingdoms, and it alone God's kingdom, ruled by him, will stand forever. Hold on. Make sure y'all understand. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. All of you have been praying for that kingdom all this time. And you, many of you didn't even know what it was. Well, now you know why it's called the end time. All right? So we get that out of the way because... A lot of people are calling it the end times. It's not the end times. It's the time of the end. If you focus on the end times, you're going to think that the world is coming to an end. You're right. The world is coming to an end, not the earth. When the Bible refers to the world, it's talking about mankind. And specifically, wicked mankind. That's why Jesus says his followers are no part of the world. So, I'm hoping that there was something beneficial for some of you. Those of you who stayed around until now. 29 minutes, ladies and gentlemen. That's where you're to start with the information that we're here to talk about. Ladies and gentlemen, we're here to talk about some perfect information. First thing, the plaintiff had the option to utilize tax credits to offset debt. Ladies and gentlemen, the plaintiff had the option to utilize the tax credits to offset the debt. That's all I put in there. That's where we're going to start. You guys don't mind? Because sat packers, start your engines. Those of you who've got arbitration awards, start your engines. Those of you who've got debts, banks coming after your property, start your engines, people. The first thing we told y'all, if you got a mortgage, 
You need to send the QWR equitable redemption contract to them mother... Ladies and gentlemen, those of you who have done that, you are ahead of the game. Those of you who haven't done that, that contract don't cost you a dime. That contract don't cost you a dime. You send it, it's a bona fide agreement because it's a prior contract you have with them. You're just notifying them that you're changing the terms of the agreement. There's nothing in your revocable deed of trust. The only part of the deed of trust that's irrevocable is the part about the right to sell. The rest of that contract is revocable. Go back, look up the words. I've already shown you guys that. So if that's the case, ladies and gentlemen, move the mic so I'm not yelling in y'all ear. If that's the case, ladies and gentlemen, then that means that you can by all means send them a contract. Have them default in the contract. Document the default. Document everything that occurred in an outline because you have to document the debt. That's why you have to document you sent them the contract. You have to document you gave them an opportunity to cure by sending them an opportunity to cure their default. Your opportunity to cure the default should be a simple letter saying, hey, you mother in default. Okay? Now, the only way y'all can cure your default, you need to prove that you opted out of the contract within the time period. Ten days. Calendar days, that is. And that you sent me that communication prior to the expiration of those 10 calendar days. If you can't do that, then you're going to remain in default and everything comes due. Automatic acceleration. Same thing as you mother tried to do to me. Mother, I'm doing the same thing to you. They're going to ignore you because that's what they do. The law says they can't ignore you. The law says that as long as you had a prior agreement with them, well, go look at the Bradley Christopher Stark Act. That is the law. Now, we are going to, because it's a private act, we're going by the principles established by that act. A contract exactly identical to yours. A process exactly identical to the one you are doing. Has an arbitration clause in it. Ladies and gentlemen, doesn't matter. You don't need to get it confirmed. There is no law saying you need to get your arbitration award confirmed. I've been trying to tell y'all, take that award and write that mother off and use that debt to offset. But unless you do the 1099C, document the debt, follow the process, you won't be able to offset and save your home. Ladies and gentlemen, nobody else has been trying to educate people on this stuff. And here's the thing. You guys are paying thousands of dollars to people to try to save your home. Or this process costs you very little. Okay? Even the arbitration is deferred. Now, you send it to them, they don't respond. You give them three days, they don't respond, and you send them a letter saying, this is a notice of intent. Yeah, I intend to go to the arbitrator. Okay? And I intend to get an award from the arbitrator, but until such time, you owe me for the amount of this contract. plus or saved whatever the arbitrator shall determine. But for the time being, I'm going to hold you liable for the full amount of the contract. You must provide payment within 30 days of receipt of this notice. You cannot carry the default because having a duty to respond and failing to respond constitutes acquiescence to the terms 
of the agreement. The document that we put up yesterday, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's called a sample motion. Hold on. Sample motion for reconsideration vacating of judgment. The case law that I just mentioned to you is in here. Okay? Plus the Bradley Christopher Stark Act. We're going to save. It should have already been saved. Okay. Plus the Bradley Christopher Stark Act is in here. But there are several different laws in here. Party waives the right to contest the arbitration by failing to do a timely objection. Oh, and by the way, plaintiff returned modified agreement, conditional acceptance. You have the right to change the terms of the agreement by giving them an offer. The defendant's attorney's letter rejected the counteroffer. However, the same letter from the attorney contained a conditional acceptance notice of change in terms of conditions, a renewal of the original offer. While silence itself is not an acceptance, absent a duty to speak, a duty to speak is imperative as a matter of law where conduct, not speaking, remaining silent, accompanied by silence, having a duty to respond and failing to respond would be deceptive or beguiling. See, if they have a duty to respond and they don't respond, then that means they forsook their duty. Beguiling. By remaining silent, silence doesn't mean we don't agree. See, that's the deception part. Because the law says if they don't agree, they have to object. They have to reject. They have to. They have to. Just like the letter rejected the counteroffer. However, they sent them in their same letter the renewal of the original offer, and the person didn't reject. We have a disclaimer in all my emails. It's not applying to any of you people. It's applying to all the companies who are trying to contract. Even though somebody sent me a law, and you're going to see in a second, this video will be over an hour, so y'all just need to be prepared. Someone sent me a law saying that you cannot contract with someone through electronic communications. That's a lie. Click and slide agreements. Click and slide agreements. All you got to do is shrink wrap, click and slide. Okay? Clicking on anything, you can click on... Uh, I filed a claim. I bought a hammock, ladies and gentlemen, and it's a sturdy hammock. Very sturdy hammock. I bought it because it was sturdy. I didn't have to put up any post or anything. It already came inclusive of the post. One unit. Folded out and everything. Pretty sturdy. It's just the metal through the manufacturer is bent. So the hammock wasn't even. And I fell sitting into the hammock. Yeah, I know it, was, it wasn't funny. It could be funny now. Ha, ha, he, he. And I landed on my posterior. You landed on your what? I landed on my posterior. What the is a posterior? My anus, you ignorant mother. I'm sorry, ladies and gentlemen. And when I did, it was the bone, not the flesh, that I landed on. I have three herniated discs in my back. And a spinal bifida. What's a spinal bifida? Well, it's a vertebrae that isn't completely connected. The final vertebrae of the back. Oh, so you have a broken back. Well, technically, it's not broken. Well, if it's, if it's not fully connected, then something's wrong. That's right. A lot of people have spinal bifidas. But I've always had it. And thus, always low back pain. And so I called Amazon because I purchased the item through Amazon, and I reported it to them. That was a week and a half ago. I've gone to the doctor, I'm getting ready to, re uh, to schedule an appointment for some labs and all that stuff and chiropractic. But Amazon had one of their claim reps who worked for Amazon contact me. And it was the day I was making the appointment to go to the doctor before 
5 o'clock that afternoon, they sent me another letter talking about, we contacted you and you haven't responded. And I wrote them back, look here, just because you send an email doesn't mean that I'm going to respond to you immediately within the same day. Second, this just happened two days ago. I haven't even been to the doctor yet. I won't be seeing the doctor until Thursday. Third, don't you ever think that you can talk to me that way. That was my response to them. They immediately sent it and outsourced it to another company, the company who handles their claims. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I received an email, but the email didn't actually say anything. So it just said the person's name and the claim number. And I ignored it. Then the person sent me another email giving me the claim number, his information, telephone number, his name. And that was the extent. And so I wrote him back and I said, how dare you sit up here and send me an email asking me for information about a medical matter and not identifying exactly who you are and how you related to this. All you said was your name and your phone number. And you, apparently your email includes the name of the company you work for. I don't know who you are. I don't have a contract with you. So he wrote me back, told me that he's the company that, he works for the company that handles their junk. And for Amazon, their claims. And I'm thinking, okay. So he wrote that back. And so I wrote him back and I explained to him, first of all, that doesn't prove anything. You can say what you want. I said, I'm going to call Amazon and I'm going to confirm who you are. Second, in your email, you're talking about reviewing your policies and your procedures by clicking on a link. I ain't clicking on nothing, and nor am I creating an account with your company. I'm going to continue to send you whatever it is through my email portal. I don't have an agreement with you to set up an account with you. Your contract is with Amazon. It ain't with me. And I am not willing to recontract. And by the way, I know that your policies and procedures have an arbitration clause. So I do not wish to participate in your arbitration agreement. I opt out. Because that's the way you're supposed to do it, ladies and gentlemen. That's how it happens every day. Well, let me, to make this long story, oh my goodness. Oh boy, it was long. I'm sitting up here hyperventilating because of how long that story was. Oh, we Lord, that story. Shut up and go back. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a, a thing here that allows me to get rid of this section right here, and I think it might be this. There we go. Okay, what I need to make sure you all know that the arbitration clause in the document, that's why, why I tell you about Bradley Christopher Stark. That's why I give him credit. Adding an arbitration agreement to the contract was the game changer, the max siller. And because they have not changed the Arbitration Act, ladies and gentlemen, go to saalimited.com forward slash PDFS, PDFs. With an S, all capitalized, salimited.com forward slash PDFs. PDFs with the PDF, P as in Paul, D as in David, F as in Frank, S as in Sam. All capital letters. And pull down the contracts, all of the ones that you see there. The ones for mortgages, you got that. The ones for incarceration, you got that. Ladies and gentlemen. I will be doing a video by Friday on incarcerated individuals and utilizing the Bankruptcy Act to offset that debt. We needed to talk about that. We're going to talk about that. We got a lot of people with arbitrations and a lot of people with contracts with the state and the right to offset their debt. Remember, Congress said that the Bradley Christopher Stark Act operated as a release dismissal agreement. Let's bring this to a head, people. Okay? Y'all know that they're going to come my way. So, I don't care. 
I'm I'm ready to play. Put me in, coach. Coach, put me in. What? Next season? I ain't got no time to be waiting the next season. I want to be in now. So we're going to do this now. Those of you who have lost faith in the arbitration process, stop worrying about what the courts are saying. Notice that the courts are trying to vacate arbitration awards after the 90 days. They have a right to vacate your arbitration award within 90 days if you apply for confirmation of your award before the 90 days expiration of the issuance of the arbitration. You have to wait 100 days. Been saying that seven whole days for 100 years and nobody's paying attention. We have several people who were in a rush because they were being greedy trying to get their award confirmed. I told them there were too many of you. I could not handle all of that and plus handle my own stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, I cannot walk you through all of this and still take care of my things because I am starting to slow down. Okay? I do recognize it. I've recognized it for the last five months. It is my fault, not yours. I've been so concerned about making sure that people who helped me out got their money's worth that I've been overextending myself. That's okay. Leave that be me. Don't worry about it. I got this. Take the first time. I told you, I already know what's coming my way. I've already seen it. Those of you who understand, when I say that I serve the true God, Jehovah, he is the one who allowed me to know what's coming my way. He's promised me. Just like he says in scripture, he told Joshua. And we're also reading about it in the book of Revelation and the book of Hebrews that he will by no means leave me, nor by any means depart from me, as long as I serve him. I am grateful that everybody knows that I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you almost cuss when you're talking, and that doesn't mean that it is. Ladies and gentlemen, go ahead. I dare any one of you to pick something that I have done as of recent that violates my God's law. Go ahead. And then I will let him judge you for that. My relationship with Jehovah ain't got nothing to do with you. So stay out of my business, people. My relationship with Jehovah, as long as I'm following his law, as long as I'm following and doing his will, is my relationship with Jehovah. It is not my relationship with you. It ain't got nothing to do with you. Whew, so glad I got that off my chest. Now, getting back to the credits and the individuals with the contracts, once you download the contract, the contract is self-explanatory. Fill out your information and just mail it out. Have proof that you mailed it out. If you want to do certified mail, that's up to you. You don't have to. But have proof that you mailed it out, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? And then do your notice of, uh, what do you call it? Just like I mentioned, uh, default, then do your notice of intent. I just told you earlier everything you need to include in each notice. You can do it yourself. You don't need a template. You can create the template yourself. should be no more than a page and a half, each one. Okay? And you provide proof that you sent that. Why? Because it's called the administrative process. You don't have to add anything else to the administrative process because the process is the process. Once you send that out to them, then you just sit back. Do you have to do the arbitration award? It solidifies it. It gives you more evidence. Do you have to go to court? No. Let a year go by. Now the courts have no jurisdiction over the arbitration whatsoever. None. They only have jurisdiction within a year. Respecting confirmation. They only have jurisdiction, 
pay attention, ladies and gentlemen, because some of you guys are not getting this. That's why we created this document for you, so that you already have the information. It'll be this one right here. Okay? This case law right here, everything you see here, watch this. You're going to love this. This says that they have 90 days right here. A person who seeks to modify or vacate an arbitration award must file an application with the court within three months after delivery of a copy of the award to the appellate. So that nobody is misunderstanding, these are just 25 cases since 2010, 2012, 2019. See, that's these cases. These are all recent cases documenting that it must be done within the 90 days. If they're going to contest your arbitration award, they cannot contest it beyond the 90 days. Many of you have had individuals contest your arbitration award after the 90 days. That's why you have to wait the 90 days. If they don't contest, what if they do contest it? We're not talking about that here. We're going to talk about that later. Right now, we're talking about this, and if they do contest it, then you still use the same document and you take out the 90-day thing. Okay? That's it. All the information is right there. Sorry, ladies and gentlemen. There is... Um, there is... an email. Uh, people are texting me because there are a lot of things going on right now. And I'm going to try to give you guys my undivided attention for the rest of this video. Like I said, we've got about another 45 minutes to go. So buckle up, okay? I was getting, I'm getting ready to start digging the septic tank. And I had to prep the soil because I'm using an auger and not a uh, backhoe. And because I'm using an auger, I want to make sure the soil is pryable. Pry? Yeah, I want to pry the soil. What about ply? Well, I want to make sure it's pliable too. But I want to make sure it's pryable so that it will be easier for me to get to where I need to go. So the company, um, American, M-A-I-D, American Made Plastics, they, the water bottles, the five-gallon water bottles, all of you should be stocking up on five-gallon water bottles. Those are the cheapest water bottles out there. A lot of the stores are empty. So contact American Made Plastics Incorporated. Go to Google, look up American Made Plastics Incorporated. They will be able to tell you where you can find bottles in your area or they will arrange to get the bottles to you. You need to be storing water. Look at all the people that are in um, Detroit and New Jersey and all these other states that don't have water. You know there's going to be more natural disasters because it's been prophesied. So you should have at least four of those water bottles filled. Okay, that's 20 gallons of water. You should have at least 20 gallons of drinking water. Well, I got a bunch of water bottles. Why would you have a bunch of water bottles? Drinking water! Five gallons! Sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, there are water dispensaries. Glacier charges $2 to fill up a five-gallon water bottle. The five gallons worth of water, filtered water, for, pay attention, $2. You guys are buying water bottles, and you're paying over $7. And you're not getting five gallons. Something ain't, somebody ain't doing the math. So if you buy the five gallon water bottles and you literally replace the water every six months, water can stand good for six months. After that, you need to go because water is alive, ladies and gentlemen. Water is alive. It has bacteria and everything else in it, good bacteria. So what you don't want to do is let water sit for more than six months in a water bottle. You have to replace it. 
You can use that water, the, the old water, for your grass, your lawn, your gardening, whatever it is you need to use it for. I'm using it for a backhoe. Anyway, so, ladies and gentlemen, that's the suggestion. But American Maine, uh, I ended up getting the number, and I didn't realize it until yesterday, that I got the number to the CEO because I got it from a company who does business with the CEO. I'm not giving you his number. The, that CEO, let me, let me be honest with you guys, that CEO reminds me of me. He's customer-oriented. He's looking out for the client. He wants to make sure they're satisfied with his product. The same thing as I did when I got back in the swing of things. My job was to catch up to all of the things that went wrong while I was gone with SATCOM. We're almost there. We're not there quite. Sorry. We are working on the tax credits now. That We have a meeting tonight, and that's going to be our main focus and the main thing we're going to be talking about. So you sat packers, I need you to sit back, be patient with us a little while longer. You will start to receive more information. Now, remind you, sat packers, you all have received the full amount of what you have paid for some time ago. What's happening now is the additions we said that we would continue to add. We didn't give you a time frame on when we would add those things, but we told you that's what we would do, okay? We told you that's what we would do. So you're just going to have to be patient as we provide that information. Those of you who are not SAP Packers, the tax credits, this video is designed to let you know that you can use tax credits to offset debt. You don't create tax credits for yourself. You don't want to create tax credits for yourself because then you work into the issue of fraud. Okay? So you have to document the tax credits. But what we have done is we've created contracts that has a dollar amount in the contract and it's a workable agreement between parties. Parties who are consenting, who can agree that they are doing this or they are doing that. That's what our contracts do. And because the party has a certain amount of time to do this or do that, there are tax credits associated. Because I already have more than 24 different contracts that I have allowed a year to expire, the tax credits are legitimate. The tax credits are cognizable in law. And I am getting ready to write that junk off like crazy. That's why I told you guys about the high-tech software, BillSoft. High-tech BillSoft. H-I-T-E-C-H. High-tech BillSoft. It's a free software. Go watch the video. It automatically does your accrual method. We gave people 98 series numbers. All they have to do is file the taxes with the 98 series numbers. Now, we know that some people are not going to understand how to do a foreign corporation and the tax credits and all of that stuff. So each one of our SAP packers, we're working on getting you guys the serial number for your trust. To make that trust, since you haven't used it, since you haven't used it, and since it's part of the SATCOM International Trust. That's what we're doing for you guys. Yeah, I have. There was a person I was supposed to call, and I did not call him. And so I need to call him. Oh, so I'm going to have to put you guys on pause, and then we'll get back to the tax credits. Sorry, I do have to call this person. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it's been about 30 minutes since I put you all on pause. I know it was only a second for you, but it was 30 minutes for me. So let's get back to what we were talking about. We're talking about offsetting your debt. Now, we're going to go over a couple of case laws. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, God, I almost choked on that word again. I'm sorry. Uh, case sites. <laughs> case law. <coughs> sorry. 
can't say that word anymore because uh, the, the courts don't make laws, so none of their cases are law, ever. No matter what they say, no matter how they say it, no matter what they write, it's not law. This is dealing with a 1040. Tax computation can be complicated business. Why? Even if Moore failed to report certain campaign contributions as income, that additional gross income would not necessarily translate into an additional taxable income. Moore might have been able to make use of deductions or other offsets to reduce the tax liability. But nobody said nothing about no tax liabilities, y'all. The question was, the plaintiff had the option to utilize tax credits. They said deductions. Well, deduction is a credit, ain't it? Yeah, and all sets are credits, aren't they? Yeah, okay. Vereen versus Vereen. 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 Anyway, uh, Wolverine. <laughs> anyway, the parties presented little evidence concerning the child, Brianna. Until January 24, 2003, the plaintiff paid court-ordered child support in the amount of $150. He admitted that there was an outstanding child support arrange it. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, they do this to you. They create these stupid words. This is not a word. A-R-R-E. That's not a word. That's not even a prefix of a word. That's not even a syllable of a word. but they create it so that they can define it. The plaintiff is willing to use his entire federal income tax tax refund to eliminate the debt. Again, the question is using a tax credit to eliminate debt. This case right here is Coleman versus Kisper. The insurance company purchases tax credits or companies purchasing the tax credits could then use the tax credits to reduce their tax liability in the year 2012 through 2019. So a person can purchase tax credits, use that tax credits to reduce their taxes. That's interesting, huh? <sighs> oh, by the way, will receive the tax credit lies within the sole discretion of the Commissioner of Economics and Community Development and Commission of Revenue. Decisions on which qualified uh, Invesco will receive the tax credit. Okay, it's within, it means that according to their policies. A Chilean Pharmaceutical Incorporated versus law. Man, somebody sued the law. Anyway, to exchange such credit with the state for a credit refund, credit refund, remember that phrase, ladies and gentlemen, because that's important for those of you who want to receive a credit refund. That's the phrase we've been looking for for months. Credit refund. That's what you're doing with the tax credits. Now, I'm going to pause right here. We're going to stop at the credit refund, okay? We need to talk, but I need to put you guys on pause, and we'll come back. Okay, had the um, trash collectors came, and I have a trash can that I had to go get from them so that it doesn't blow all over the place. Ladies and gentlemen, microphone's way over here. i got to put it back on my head. had to take it off because it would have disconnected from the system. Ladies and gentlemen, what I left off before I put you guys on hold was to let you know that there are some people who are taking the information. I'm giving people ideas about the tax refund and how to do, or the credit refund, Whew, tax refund, credit refund. I'm giving people ideas in my videos. I'm helping put pieces to their puzzle that they have together. You know, these individuals don't call me and tell me what success they've had. They don't tell me how much it's helped, how they needed that piece. They don't tell me what they've been able to put together. But they are able to move forward 
with certain things and they're able to benefit from it but they keep me out of the loop with such beneficial information why because they don't recognize that there are almost 8 billion people on the planet and so they want to be able to corner the market to where they can get money from all 8 billion people and 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 and, and keep it to themselves because they don't understand that there is enough to go around but be that as it may i want you guys to pay attention to something let's continue in exchange for such credit with the state, so they get to sell their credit to the state, pay attention, for a credit refund equal to 65 cents of the value of the credit. Why 65 cents of the value of the credit when it's supposed to be dollar for dollar? Pay attention. Section 12, 1, or 217EEA clearly provides a qualified small business taxpayer with the choice, with the choice, with a choice of one of two options regarding its unused research and development tax credits or its unused tax credits. Pay attention. The taxpayer may elect to carry such credits forward or it may apply to the defendant in exchange for such credit or credit refund. It's just saying they can't do both. In other words, here, you can't use the unused tax credits to carry forward and get a refund. <laughs> okay? It, and that makes sense, doesn't it? That does make sense. You, you, How can you carry it forward when you're getting a refund on it? Okay, that's it says nothing in the text suggests in any way that these two conceptually distinct options may be combined. Which makes sense. Oh. But what they're saying is if you're going to carry it forward, the remaining part, you can't carry forward because you asked for a refund. That's what they are trying to imply, and that's a lie because that's not what the person is doing. The remaining part is what they get to carry forward. That's the law. You get to carry the remaining part forward. The part that you don't receive a refund for, you get to carry forward. That's the law. They're trying to make it seem like these individuals were doing something wrong. So let's go back to finding out who it is. This individual's last name is not law. These are the individuals who are trying to carry it forward. There's a business tax credit. That's why it's research and development. Okay. Oh, by the way, let me let me point this out to you guys. Companies do tax credits and get refunds all the time. Companies get refund when they apply the tax credits all the time. The government gave each one of you a corporation. We've already shown you Title 31 CFR Code of Federal Regulations Section 363.20.27 where the Social Security number is inexchangeable exchangeable with the EIN number you have a sole proprietor ship which is why you're allowed to operate a sole proprietor and still do a 1040 it is your sole proprietor ship which is the taxpayer not you the private person the private citizen pay attention they gave you a corporation you should be writing off your taxes. Don't ask me how to do it. Do your research, people. Now, remember, they used the word credit refund because the word credit refund is in the statute. Pay attention to that word. That's going to be your best friend. Hey, Hank. Well, what's up? Owen. What up, Owen? Now, you here again? Look. Owens testified, oh, he's a snitch. Anyway, Owens testified that in exchange for the trust investment in the winery, it could take certain federal tax credits, but 
he could not recall the amount of the tax credits received. He testified that an entity can either sell tax credits or if it makes money, it can use the tax credits to set off or offset taxes owed. Owens testified that it would be necessary for the trust to hold an equitable interest in the winery in order to use the tax credits, but there was no evidence presented by him that the trust had ever obtained an equitable interest. See, they're not denying that he couldn't do this, but ladies and gentlemen, you cannot make statements. This individual is saying, testified that he could do this or he could do that. Uh -uh. You are to testify and say, it appears that this gets to happen. It appears that that gets to happen. It appears that the law says this. It appears that the law says that. Make them prove you the appearance is wrong because it's only by appearance, okay? <sighs> for a method for a tax adjustment, when preference items give rise to a benefit in a tax year, tax credits, other than a non-benefit tax year, tax liability, in which the preference item arose, the benefit tax credits could occur as follows. Tax credits, offset tax liabilities, the so-called non-benefit, the preference item, deduction, does so as well. The amount of tax credits necessarily offset the liability taxes are thereby reduced. That's a deduction. This offset of liabilities is a deduction, not a credit. And these freed up credits can be used to offset tax in other years known as benefit years. Ladies and gentlemen, the freed up credits are known as carry forward, carry over credits. Let's go to the next one. There's a reason why we're going through each one of these. Net operating loss, NOLs, were tax credits that the federal, first federal, could utilize to offset income realized in future years. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a credit union. Let's call it a bank. First federal is a bank. Hold on, make sure. Savings alone. Okay? A Rochester, New York. I know it's got to be. Nope, not even. Nope, can't even. I don't know who that is, then, anyway. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, they use their tax credits to offset all the time. They use their net operating losses, their losses. This is why companies can go bankrupt and still remain in business. They use their losses like J.C. Penney's, and the government allows them to write off their losses. You get to do the same thing, and you get to carry them forward. None of you guys should be paying taxes. You should be operating under your sole proprietorship. You have a 98 series number. You should be operating under the sole proprietorship or under the trust and writing everything off and carrying it forward. You'll never have any tax liability. You got to understand there is no money. They need to do the books correctly. You guys are not doing what you're supposed to do, and that's shame on you. A debtor may use the remaining net operating loss to offset future personal tax liability. Again, you get to do that. But hold on. However, the trustee theorized that it was unlikely that the bankruptcy estate would have completely exhausted the $971,000 of net operating loss. In that case, the bankruptcy code provides whatever tax attributes, including net operating loss, are not utilized by the estate, revert back to the debtor after bankruptcy. So you have the tax credits coming back to you even after you file bankruptcy. If the bankruptcy doesn't take it all, whatever's remaining becomes yours, so you end up benefiting. So everybody who files bankruptcy, like 
the Trump estate and the Trump industries, whatever doesn't get ate up in those carryovers, because you're supposed to report the carryovers, those are benefits. That will offset your debt. So if you file bankruptcy, you should be documenting your credits on all aspects in the bankruptcy that's an asset they just told you plaintiff plan to use the federal tax credits obtained through the frm program to fund the project look hey wait wait <laughs> hold on y'all don't understand this is why i'm doing this video this is why i needed to show you guys this ladies and gentlemen he was going to use his federal tax credits to fund the project. Just like SATCOM utilizes tax credits to fund its bonds. Interesting, ain't it? I know, I can see the smoke coming from all the heads out there. See the wheels turning? This is a 2015 case. This is Berkeley Apartments. It's a family apartment. Versus Berkeley Township and Planning Board. Okay? They were allowing this person to use tax credits to fund their project. Tax credits are money. Ladies and gentlemen, hold on one second. Okay, the headset was giving me some sort of a indication that the battery was low, but I just checked the battery is 90%. So I needed to make sure of that. Now, if there was some audio issues, it is a new headset, so I have to get adjusted to it. I just connected it back. So if you were hearing some scratching and itching and all of that other stuff in the audio, I apologize for that. We're going to continue, though. U.S. versus Hoffman. Okay, relevant state agency determine whether those infrastructure expenditures qualify as tax credits. No, they don't get to determine that. Do you understand? The law determines it. They don't get to determine that. The law determines it. If so, those agencies will certify the tax credits based upon approved infrastructure expenditures. Once certified, tax credits could be applied to offset against Louisiana taxpayers' income tax liability or they may be sold ladies and gentlemen you can use your tax credits to offset taxes let's find out if you can use it to offset a debt and you see how this thing talks about certified tax credits not concerned about that because you don't need to have your federal tax credit certified applies to most but not all tax liability Tax credits, so something tax credits. Uh, where is it? It's not here explaining it. It looks like housing, but don't know. The credits may be used to reduce tax liability arising out of personal income taxes, bank or corporate or insurance taxes. Pay attention. The credits may be used to reduce tax liabilities arising out of personal income taxes, bank mortgages or corporate taxes business or insurance taxes okay the same same thing as before the l i h t this is a california case so i don't know what this is but let's find out what it is y'all y'all don't mind let's see this give it a second come on google smoogle the Low Income Housing Tax Credit Program, created in 1986 and made to permanent 1993, is an indirect federal subsidy used to finance the construction and rehabilitation of low income affordable rental housing. This is the low income, it's a home improvement loan. Okay but it's for rental property, okay? Just so that y'all know, now I know what it is. All right, 
So the fact that you can use a tax credit to pay, once certified, the tax credits could be applied to offset against Louisiana taxpayers' income tax liability or sold for cash. No problem. The church or developer could take the credit to the bank or financial institution that will sell them to taxpayers who owe taxes to the state. And the taxpayer buyer can use the credits to pay their taxes. Interesting, ain't it? You can take your credits to a bank and sell them. Amazing, isn't it? I can see a lot of people starting up a lot of businesses selling credits to banks. Ah, there are a lot of people out there who started their own banks. Oh, I know you're getting some ideas. Anyway, we're going to move to the next one. Ladies and gentlemen, all debt is a tax. And therefore, I wanted to document that all debt is a tax and all tax is a debt. Now, hold on now, so that y'all can see what the courts are saying, because we're going to make this this large. A tax in its essential characteristics is not a debt, nor the nature of a debt. So it looks like I can't say a debt is a tax. Something's wrong. Hold on. Let me do it again. A tax in its essential characteristics, it's a character, honey, is not a debt. A tax in its essential characteristics is not a debt, nor in the nature of a debt. Ooh-wee, tax ain't a debt, y'all. Hold on. A tax in its essential characteristics is not a debt, nor in the nature of a debt. Ladies and gentlemen, a tax is not a debt. The courts have said again and again, the courts have said again and again, the courts have said again and again that a tax is not a debt nor in the nature of a debt y'all y'all heard the courts have said that we just saw it again and again a debt is not a tax and a tax is not a debt oh wait we need to be paying attention to these cults a tax is not a debt nor in the nature of a debt there you go. We got it. I, I, hey, y'all done got your point across. Hold on. They got some more to tell us. A tax is not a debt, nor in the nature of a debt. Like I done told y'all, a tax is not a debt. I don't know what y'all sitting up here. A tax is a debt in the higher sense of the word. Wait, hold on. Hold, hold on. Hold on. Hold Y'all hold on. A tax is not a debt. Hold on. 1928. A tax is a debt in the higher sense of the word. A tax is nothing more than a debt due by the citizens to the taxing power. Look at that. They got case law to support that a tax is a debt. Wait, um, Eon, can I ask you a question? Yeah. How did you know? that a tax was a debt. Why didn't you just go with those first cases? Because this was all to prove to people that a tax is a debt. It's just something that I know. I keep telling people I know things that I've never studied. I just know it. So I put in what I knew was a fact. And of course, here we are in 2022. So the courts keep saying things, but it doesn't mesh with the reality. The law and what the courts say are not the same. That's why I always have a problem saying something like adding the word law and the word case. So I can say it backwards, law case. I can say that backwards, but saying it the other way, case, uh, that's going to cause me to choke. I, I, because the courts don't make law. So the courts can say whatever the, they want to say, but that's not the law. The law says that a tax is a debt. See, a tax is nothing more than a debt due by the citizen. Notice how a debt in the higher sense of the word. We're going to show you why there's a discrepancy. A tax is not a debt in the ordinary sense. Well, nobody's asking about the ordinary sense. Either it's not a debt or it is a debt. Okay? Either it is a debt or it's not a debt. 
It is generally considered that a tax is not a debt. We don't care about General Lee. Man, y'all know how General Lee has always been messing up things. Okay? Hold on. A, thus, a tax imposed by the sovereign is a debt. <coughs> oh, wait a minute. What? Thus, a tax imposed by the sovereign is a debt. It is a fundamental principle of statutory construction that words in a statute or constitution will be given their natural and ordinary meaning unless the context of law being considered indicates more restricted or different meaning. Ladies and gentlemen, generally speaking, there is generally, again, a debt is an obligation to pay money. Whether this obligation arises by contract, by judicial determination of tort liability, or by imposition of a tax by the sovereign, it is still an obligation to pay money. Thus, a tax imposed by the sovereign is a debt. What year was this? 1971. But we just read about 30 cases that says this court has determined that a tax is a debt. 1971. Ohio. Wait, is this the same case? Hold on. Yeah, it's the same case. It's the same case, so we can't do that. Even though it says, see, it, even though it says it differently, let's see, 282, let's see, let's see, let's see, 282, same case, all right, same case, same information. Uh, there was certainly nothing in the constitutional provision here being considered, which in any way indicates or would require that the word debt, as used therein, should be given anything other than its ordinary meaning. To the average person, an unpaid tax is a debt. And are you trying to say that you average, Eon? No. Well, that's what the court just said. Well, after I me, mean, okay. Anyway, your mama. The word debt is defined in Bouvier, Bouvier's law dictionary as being a sum of money due by certain and express agreement. A debt also therein defined as, ladies and gentlemen. Which is why child support is a debt and is offsetable in bankruptcy. Don't tell nobody. Child support is a debt and is offsetable in bankruptcy. You can set off child support, you can set off your mortgage. Look, your mortgage is nothing but a debt, it is nothing but a tax. You need to understand that. Okay, we're going to continue, ladies and gentlemen. Got one more. The plaintiff insists that a tax is not a debt. Therefore, Kooch, 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 Couch, Kutch, anyway, was not a debtor and the county not a creditor. Though it be conceded that a tax is not a debt within the generally accepted meaning of the word, which is a lie. We just learned that the generally accepted meaning of the word debt, a tax is a debt. See, that's exactly what this court did. They did the word debt as used therein should be given anything other than its ordinary meaning, its general meaning. Bouvier's different dictionary says it's a debt. So that's what you have to do. You have to show the conflicting conclusions of the court. And so we have to rely on the law. As we've noted in this case, sales taxes are just that, a tax obligation and not an ordinary. See, you see how they add these caveats, these words, ordinary? Nobody cares about ordinary. Nobody cares about ordinary. We care about what it actually means. So now some of you can see how the law works. It is technicality, and that's what the courts are doing. They're using specific words. That's why when I tell you that it takes hours to create a document, it takes hours because I have to rebut their junk. So I've worked on two documents just this week for two people, one person who I felt an obligation to, although I did not have an obligation to that person. 
And when I spoke to that person, this is what the person told me. Well, I have to wait to see what my husband says. Now, I don't mind that. I love the headship rule. I'm one of Jehovah's Witnesses. The headship rule means a lot to me. It's just when the person told me that, it was highly offensive. You see, that person has filed documents into the court, and I saw the language of the documents that were filed into the court. And for the life of me, there was no way in the world any of it was going to have a bearing on the court. The court was not going to listen to that junk. And I call it junk because that's what the court will call it. And then the person who filed it tells me that when I was giving them something, and I'm using nothing but case law, and I told them that I will use nothing but the... <coughs> <laughs> Sorry, said it again. Oh, man. I told him I would use nothing but case sites. Now use nothing but the words of the court. Told me they had to clear it with their husband first. And I just, for the life of me, couldn't understand because I saw the other paperwork. I'm like, wait, really? Did you clear that with him or did he approve of that? It bothered me. And some people say, well, I don't know why it would bother you. It would bother me because... I'm trying to help people, and so if that's your caveat, then why even tell it to me? Why even mention it to me? People will hear me all the time. I'll tell people, yes, consult with your husband. Yes, consult with your wife, because I love the headship rule. But when I told the person I'm trying to help them to keep the court from issuing a default judgment against them, because that's what they were going for, and you guys. This is the motion that I did for her, but specifically for the person, okay? And motion to, submit, to dismiss, supported by affidavit and court opinion, in harmony with positive law Title IX of the U.S. Code, prima facie evidence of the United States Arbitration Act, otherwise referred to as the Federal Arbitration Act. This is the affidavit that I put forth for the person. Securing their person putting in the case text, documenting what positive law was since I referred to positive law. Let's continue. And the award, how it did not appear to be issued in the district of the state that she's in. Thus, the court appears to be absent of jurisdiction, challenging their jurisdiction without directly irritating the idiot sitting on the bench. Because I was writing this for somebody else, I couldn't write it the way I would write for myself. I had to write this as if I'm writing it for somebody else who's not going to know what to say when they go up in the courtroom. So I had to write it to protect the person. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I have about 10 more minutes because I have to go start using the auger because I got a hole to dig. So we're going to go back to the taxes. Is that okay with y'all? Now, we got some people who have tax liens on their property. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have a tax lien on your property, the first thing you must do, if it's a rental property, then yes, you can be taxed on that property. Use your tax credits to offset the tax lien. <clears throat> Use your tax credits to offset the tax lien. Most people, you're not listening. If the government says you owe taxes, then document the tax credits. Document the tax credits. Use the accrual method. Told you about the software. It's called Hi H I T E C H T E C H Bill B I W -L, L Soft S O F T High Tech Bill Soft dot com High Tech Bill Soft dot com. The software is free, free, free. If you utilize software correctly, guess what? If you utilize the software correctly, guess what? If you utilize the software correctly, it will do your accrual method. You don't need to go to no accountant. You don't need to go to no CPA. You can do all of the arithmetic through that soft freeware. Once you document your tax credits, ladies and gentlemen, and you have a tax lien, then you send that because you're doing federal tax credits. You're going to apply the federal tax credits to the state. 
You're not going to wait for the state to give you approval or to certify your tax credits. You're going to do it federally. Now, remember, as long as, let's say the credits were issued in 2017. So I just carry them forward from 2017. Well, what about your 2017 taxes? No, I carry them forward. I did not include them in my 2017 taxes. That's why I was able to carry them forward. Carry them forward to the present year, do the taxes. That way, all you have to do is, you will have to do the 1099-C. Ladies and gentlemen, if it's over $500, $600, $800 billion, you will have to do the 1099-C, 1099-C, 1099-C. You will have to do a 1099-C. You will have to order the 1099-Cs from the Internal Revenue Service. You will have to order the 1099-Cs from the Internal Revenue Service. Call them up and say, hey, y'all, I need 100 1099-Cs. I need 400 1099-Cs. You don't need no more than 100, ladies and gentlemen, because many of you don't have that type of debtors on you. Okay? You don't need more than 100. So I just need you guys to wake up. Wake up, little Susie! Wake up! Okay? Need you guys to wake up. It's time to wake up. Whew. I'm so glad we had this time together. The defendant insists. Nope, same one. Such tax merely constitute a tax debt. That's your phrase. Whew. The state contends that under the common law, it was the prerogative of the sovereign to have his debts paid out of a debtor's property in preference to the debts of other creditors and that the state has succeeded to this preference in the absence of a statute. The state is not the sovereign. The people are the sovereign. I'm sorry, does anybody recognize what I just said? The state is not the sovereign. The state never was the sovereign. The state is only the sovereign because state representatives say they're the sovereign, but the people are the sovereign. Okay? So you must come in under your capacity as one of the people, a beneficiary to the trust. Sorry. Hold on. Do you see this right here, ladies and gentlemen? The first thing it says, I, Ralph Walton, am a beneficiary of the local, state, and federal trusts. And as such, I choose to respond to the request for summary judgment in the following manner. Because it's my right. I'm not asking you for permission, ignorant mother... Okay. Now, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a law in Tennessee. Tennessee? Bonita Applebo. Anyway... This tax levy shall be such proportion of the tax levy levied by the absorbed county for bonds. You know bonds are tax exempt? Does anybody know that? That's what this is all about, ladies and gentlemen. That's what this section is all about. This is about the exemption of bonds. Any floating indebtedness or bonded indebtedness of an absorbed county not funded or refunded under this section shall be paid out of the tax levied against the property absorbed in the county. This is the exemption for that state. Debt reorganization. I'm sorry, we need to go back. Sorry. There is There are two things. I said exemption and I'm showing you the wrong one. Bond tax exempt. That's the part where I was going to say, no bond issue under the authority of this shall be subject to taxation in this state or by any county or municipality, municipality thereof, and such bonds shall so state on its face. Okay, that's what you guys need to know. And this is, see this act of 1939? This was the Securities Act, Trust Indentured Act. This was that session. Now, this is a state of Tennessee, but this was just letting y'all know. Ladies and gentlemen, let's do a recap real brief. The beginning of this video talked about how the people who are using the phrase the end times and afraid that the world is going to be destroyed, that's not what the scriptures say. 
He's only getting rid of those people who are stupid and disobedient, who don't want to listen, who don't want to do what's right. That's his promise. He has made that promise to people for more than 6,000 years. The moment Adam sinned, he put that promise out there for everybody to know that he wasn't just twiddling his thumbs, sitting on his hands. So when you see people suffering, he has the ability and the authority to bring individuals back to life, which is why Jesus had to be resurrected. That's why the scriptures promised that he was going to be resurrected. That's why they could expect him to be resurrected. That's why they were in anticipation. Why do you think Mary Magdalene was waiting by the gravesite? Because she was anticipating a resurrection. Because that was the promise. That's how he's going to correct everything. All of the people who have died, who were not wicked, he has promised a resurrection. Go and take a look for yourself. John 5, 28, 29. I've already shown you Revelation the 20th chapter, verse 14 and 15. Well, 11 through 15. Go and take a look. Or Revelation, the 21st chapter, verse 3 and 4, where it talks about how individuals will not die anymore. Then you got Isaiah, the 35th chapter, which pretty much references the exact same thing or the 65th chapter of Isaiah, which says that there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. Okay, not a new earth is a brand new planet, but a new earth is all that stupid stuff will be gone. That's what the scriptures mean by the end times, getting rid of the old and bringing in the new. Okay, after that, we started talking about individuals doing arbitrations. A lot of people don't know much about arbitration. They don't know much about history or biology, you know, and that's their problem. But many of you who've watched my videos have gained a better understanding of arbitration. Arbitration is not controlled by the state courts, not even the federal courts. The federal courts do not control arbitration. Arbitration is controlled by statute. It's called the United States Arbitration Act, or known as the Federal Arbitration Act. The Federal Arbitration Act, or the United States Arbitration Act, allows for a party to engage in a contractual agreement that includes an arbitration clause. Just that simple. They are permitted, allowed, to engage in a contract. Sorry, I'm taking out the battery. Got to be careful, because I don't want to shut the video off and then lose everything. Taking out the battery because I want to save energy. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Many people have not utilized the contracts. The contracts are free. We talked about where to get the contracts and how to utilize the contracts, download the contracts. All you got to do is mail them out. Don't worry about it. It's not a movement or anything. Now, I can't tell you whether an arbitrator will rule in your favor because there may not be a default. There may not be a prior agreement. But if you take care of all the prerequisites, no one can rule contrary to you, not even the courts. The courts would have to violate the law. Now, the reason why you see the change in the courts in their so-called opinions, how they contradict each other, is because the courts deal with what's known as public policy. They claim that they're doing what's in the best interest of the public. What's in the best interest, interest of the public is for the public to be dumbfounded, to have the wool pull over their eyes because we don't want anyone to panic. That's why they do that, ladies and gentlemen. But we don't care about their perception of public policy because we are private citizens. We are beneficiaries to the trust. You cannot put public policy over our secured rights. So after we made a suggestion to people who were getting arbitrations done, to get their arbitration contracts done, get the contract taken care of first. Go, we gave them the address, SAA Limited, S as in Sam, A as in Apple, A as in Apple, Limited, L-I-M-T-E-D, L-I-M-I-T-E-D, limited.com, C-O-M, forward slash PDF, D is in Paul, D is in David, F is in Frank, S is in Sam, all capital letters, PDF. Hit enter, and you'll go right to the site. Go down to the middle of the pages, you'll see all the contracts. 
download every one of them and utilize the ones that benefit you. Then send them out. That's it. You wait 15 days. I would wait literally 12 days from the date that you know they received it. Then you send them out a notice. Hey, y'all in default. The only way you can cure is proving that you responded in a timely fashion, according to the terms and conditions of the agreement. Then they get three days to respond. Three calendar days. Make sure you say calendar. Do not say anything other than calendar days. After you say three calendar days, ladies and gentlemen, the next thing you do is you say, hey, how y'all doing? I just want to introduce myself. Uh, y'all were in default. Well, now y'all can't cure the default. So y'all need to comply. And since y'all don't seem like y'all want to comply, I'm going to apply for arbitration. You don't have to apply for arbitration immediately. You can take your time. But here's the point. Once you apply for arbitration, the arbitrator is only considering whether or not there is a default. The arbitration is not considering whether or not you right or you wrong. The arbitration is only considering whether or not there is a default. Ladies and gentlemen, that's why it's a surefire process, because once they're in default, all you need to do is supply proof that you've notified them of each thing. And they are given an opportunity to provide proof that they responded in a timely fashion, according to the terms and conditions of the agreement. If they don't provide you proof, they have no leg, no footing to stand on. The arbitrator has only one choice if they're in default, and that is to bring a judgment against them. However, the arbitrator under law gets to determine what the award amount is to be, if any. That's the arbitrator's choice, not yours. Doesn't matter if the contract says 185 quadzillion. The arbitrator is left with the final decision. And once you get that decision, you wait 90 days. Anybody who's waited 90 days, if they vacated your award, don't you dare worry because the court was without jurisdiction and you can do a motion to vacate anytime you can go into the appeals court. Say the court lacked jurisdiction. Doesn't matter about you saying the court can revisit. No, the court does not have the authority to revisit. The award cannot be challenged after 90 days. That is the law. Doesn't matter if they said that they did this wrong or that wrong. The statute only permits vacating of the award within 90 days. And the Supreme Court unanimously, unanimously held in Archer that they must follow the statute as written. But you don't have to go for confirmation. You can go for your tax credits. Remember, we were doing this video on getting a refund. So let's do this. Gotta get rid of that G. What up, G? Do you see what I just did right there? The plaintiff used a credit refund to pay off mortgage because that's what I'm suggesting to you all. After this refinance by the plaintiff and her father, the defendant made the majority of the mortgage payments, and yet the plaintiff took the tax deduction on her personal return for the interest and received a refund as a result. No, the plaintiff paid the defendant a refund on the home equity line of credit, which was then applied to bring the mortgage current and any other arrears, arrears? On the marital residence current. Okay, the money's paid off credit card debt note, uh plaintiff uh plaintiff credit equity full mortgage no i'm you know what we got to do it this way 
because it's using the word credit and it's not using the phrase or term credit refund. Okay, now what I want you to do, modified her claim of exemption to include that refund and claim it as exempt under Colorado Revised Statute. And those of you in Colorado, y'all need to be looking up this exempt code. Okay, she said her refund was exempt. This is the code in Colorado, which allows a debtor to exempt the full amount of any federal or state earned income tax credit refund. Means they can't touch it. You all child support, they can't touch it. This is the code that says you're exempt, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, this person got a credit refund. Read the case, find out how Walsh got a credit refund. Ladies and gentlemen, Additional language in this section right here, which we referred to earlier for Connecticut, also suggests that a carry forward credit cannot be exchanged for a refund, providing in relevant part that a qualified small business taxpayer may apply to the defendant for a credit refund. Did I say cannot be? Yeah, that a carry forward credits cannot be exchanged for a refund. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is state credits, not federal. Carry forward credits can be used for a refund on federal. Once again, it sought to receive a credit refund equal to one third of the 2004 credit. This is 2009. Okay, so credit refund is where you want to go. Now, here's the thing this is what I want you guys to pay attention to. What I'm about to do right here, right here, about to do. Hey, can you search for Google? How did you know that's what I was getting ready to do? Well, because I, I just really, you know, that's what I was interested in. So did you search for Google? Yeah, I searched for Google. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, the key word was credit refund. <sighs> refund and credit for income taxes paid. We don't want refund and credit. We want credit refund. We want those two words together. Guaranteed payment mortgages and delivery of satisfaction of mortgage. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen, those of you who have mortgages, I'm trying to help you. If a person eligible for a property tax refund died, these people, the credit refund for homeowners, a renter's property tax refund. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Minnesota. You guys need to understand if you're paying property taxes and it is your private home, your private residence, then cannot tax you. I just spoke with somebody when I put you guys on hold earlier. I spoke with her. She has a tax lien on her property. I told her months ago that she just needed to do, because it's a tax lien, so how do you get rid of a tax lien? By documenting the fact that I didn't owe you any taxes. You couldn't lien my property. It's the forbidden fruit doctrine. Doesn't matter what happened subsequent to the lien. If the original lien was illegal, wrong, unconstitutional, then there is no justification if somebody even sold it at a tax lien sale. There was no authority to sell it at a tax lien sale. So by putting in the paperwork, I don't owe you this money. Here is the proof that I am a non-taxpayer when it comes to property taxes on my private property because my private property is exempt from taxation and the Uniform Commercial Code, Article 9, Section 102, and Article 9, Section 109 acknowledges the fact that my private property is mine. And the government has no sovereign authority over my private property. Ladies and gentlemen, there you go. That's an hour and 54 minutes worth of me providing this information for you. All I can tell you, and then to do a recap at the end, man. All I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, is if you didn't gain any information out of this video right here, and if you cannot benefit from it, something is wrong with you. That You heard me say that. Now, the second thing I'm going to mention to all of you, you didn't have to say that to us like that, sir. I mean, that was kind of, don't worry about it. If you don't like it, move past it. 
Don't hold on to it. If you want to sit still, you sit still. Oh, you sit still. No, sit still. Don't don't move. No, just sit still. I'll be with you in a minute. So if y'all want to sit still and just marinate on just one point, y'all do that. You want to let something fester? You sit there and let it fester. The rest of us, we're going to move on. Is that okay? Ladies and gentlemen, the information provided here are several different subjects. Each of you have several different things you need to accomplish. So focus on the most important thing and accomplish that one first. And then go to the next one and the next one after that. Stop trying to do everything all at once because you're not going to get it done. I'm telling you, they're about to hit y'all across the forehead and then the back of the head and then the side of the head, both sides, at the same time. So to keep you from getting your clock rocked, y'all need to be taking care of your offsets of your taxes. Y'all need to be getting y'all money. Go get y'all money. Go get y'all money. Go get y'all money. Now, I got to go, ladies and gentlemen. Okay? I got to let y'all get on what y'all getting on. You know, I like this because it's wintry. And you, you see how it's got the ice. It's supposed to be moving. Sometimes it moves. Sometimes it don't. And it's the CPU that's making it not move. See, there's moving. See, moving. Got the agua. Agua flow. Aha. Uh -huh. This is where I get my water from my water bottles. That's right. I just hold my bottle underneath right here and fill it on up. Because, you know, the white water doesn't contain all those nasty particles. So that's why you go with the white water. You don't go with the black water. Black water gets you in a lot of trouble. Ain't that right, uh, Mr. Cheney? Ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen and ladies, ladies and gents, thank you for the last hour and 56 minutes, actually over two hours for me. Thank you for letting me bring this information to your attention. I now got to go and start auguring. Gotta go, gotta go, gotta go. Y'all take care. Stay out of trouble. And again, I hope it was beneficial. Gotta go, gotta go, gots to go.